Welcome to the King's Word Bible Study. Today our topic is going to be the moat and the beam. Let's begin today in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in the third verse, it says, And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Last week we looked at the importance of following the Lord's command to judge not, but we need to take a closer look at his lesson about the moat and the beam. Verse 3 said, And why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? The first thing that stands out here is the term beholdest. What does that really mean? In the Greek, it means to see, be observant, be watchful. It suggests something physical, with spiritual results and perception. That is, it carries what is seen into the non-physical and material realm, so a person can take the needed action to respond, beware, and be alert. What we can gather from this definition is what we already intuitively know. When we're looking at other people's lives, trying to find moats, we're being observant and watchful. We're looking carefully, trying to see what we can spot. We're looking for the physical, though, for the natural, for the carnal, because those are the parts of the man that deviate from God's will so many times. We're looking for the missteps, the mistakes, and the misfortunes. We're looking for everything that isn't up to our standard. Instead of looking to the supernatural or the spiritual side of that man, the part that's most likely striving to do better and battling daily with the temptations and the attacks of the enemy, We instead point out what we know to be of natural and carnal origin, giving the man a hard time because his fallen nature got the upper hand in some scenario, but we all have that happen. We then expect them to hear our rebuke and to respond with gratitude, being willing to respond and be alert to what they need to do. That's a lot to ask from a fallen man, especially because it didn't even come from his God. It came from the minds and the inclinations of other fallen men. They're in just as precarious and terrible a condition as he's in himself. It's hypocrisy again. And that's a thread that you find running all throughout any scripture or passage that has to do with judging others. What about the moat, though? What is that exactly? What is it that we're so eager to find in other people? In the Greek, it means a small dry stalk, a chip of wood, a twig, a splinter, chaff. The first thing that we can gather here is that we're dealing with matters that are small issues, issues that in the grand scheme of things aren't really that big of a deal. Not only are they small things, but they're like chaff, and that's very important. Psalm 1 and 4 says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Psalm 35 and 5 says, Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. The farmers... When it came time for the winnowing, would throw their grain with the chaff up into the air, letting the wind separate the good grain from the bad chaff. The grain had weight, which would cause it to fall back down to the ground, while on the other hand, the chaff was light. It had no substance, making it easy for the wind to carry it off. The moat is the chaff. It's a vestige of our old ways, a vestige of our carnality. And when thrown up into the wind, it can easily and quickly be blown away. But how does that happen? What wind are we talking about? Acts 2 and 2, referring to the Holy Ghost, says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. The wind of the Holy Spirit, blowing in a man's life, when he submits himself and surrenders himself to his influence, will blow away the chaff. It will remove the moat before it can take root and grow to become a beam. John 3 and 8 says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Having the wind of the Holy Ghost blowing through the chambers of our heart, blowing through the corridors of our minds, blowing through every last aspect and area of our lives is a hallmark of being Spirit-filled. That's what we're meant to be. We have moral failures. We have lapses of judgment. We have times where we miss the mark. And if we're looking for those, we'll find moats in those moments. But when the wind blows, it'll be removed. The Holy Ghost is the only one that can remove it. We're not powerful enough on our own to do so. Only He can help us where we're too weak to help ourselves. 
We also have to note that the moat is like a dry stalk. A dry stalk is a dying one, one that lacks any of the moisture that would give it life. It's on its way out. And so is the moat, if only we would let the Holy Spirit have his way. When we give him time and space to work, when we cooperate with him, he removes the moats from our eyes, restoring to us again our vision. The other people, the people who are looking to judge, aren't looking at it that way, though. They do what in the natural would be the equivalent of picking a scab. They try to reopen a wound that's already in the process of healing, and they rebuke you all the while that it isn't completely healed yet. When the work of healing was never your own, it's God's. Why don't they rebuke God instead? Even they aren't foolish enough to do that. So they set their sights on you because you're the easier target. They can get the ego boost that they're looking for off of pointing out your shortcomings while looking completely past their own, which leads us to the next thing that we need to look at. The eye in both the example of the moat and the beam is referring to the spiritual sense of sight, or as the Greek puts it, the mind's eye. The Greek also says it means vision. That's important, especially as it relates to the beam. The man judging is the one who has the beam sticking out of his eye. So what is the beam exactly that we're referring to? In the Greek, it means a large beam or joist of wood, a beam of timber, a log on which planks in the house rest, a pole sticking out grotesquely, a huge log that obstructs someone's vision. There's some major differences between the moat and the beam. The first is the size. The other was just a small little wood chip, a little thin stock, but this is a giant log, a thick beam. The next difference is the effect that the wind would have on either of these. The moat's small and it lacks real substance, so the wind can easily blow it away, but that's not so with the log. Logs are heavy, and especially when they fall over and they're laying along the ground, the wind can't easily move them, so they stay there and they remain stationary and immovable. Even hurricanes struggle to move dense, heavy logs, especially when they're tucked away deep in a forest. They're not easily moved, and that's for a reason. That shows the difference that we're dealing with here. A beam is a big moral issue, a glaring inconsistency, a major failure, and a major deviation from God's will. But we all make mistakes, and we all miss the mark. So what makes this so bad? What makes it so different from the moat? This is something that's grown so out of proportion, so beyond its normal or understandable limits, that it's taken on a life of its own. This was a beam on which planks for a house rest, which is really important. What that tells us is that something is being built on top of this. It leads to something else, and what it's really doing is supporting something else. So what is it that it's supporting exactly? It's supporting and encouraging further deviation from God's will. And it's supporting the enemy's attempts to make further and deeper inroads into your life. Then on top of that, there's a house beam built on top of it. What does that mean? The word from which the word for beam is derived from in the Greek means to receive, to take, to accept, to welcome. The concordance goes further to say that it means to receive in a receptive, welcoming way, warmly and readily receptive. The personal element is emphasized. This stresses the high level of self-involvement, high level of interest involved with the welcoming and the receiving. This shows the real sinister nature of this plot of the enemy. This beam didn't get there by chance. It didn't just magically or mysteriously fall into place there. It was invited in. It was welcomed in. It was accepted and received with readiness and willingness. It's important to note that as Christians, we can never be possessed by demons or unclean spirits. But we can be oppressed. We can allow them to have an undue influence on our life, on the way that we think and speak and act. And what we see here is that they're being welcomed to influence our spirit, which is a home, a spiritual home. It's the holy of holies, so the temple of our body, the place that's meant to be reserved specifically for God's Holy Spirit to dwell, reserved specifically for Him to influence our life. But we allow the temple to be overrun and desecrated by the enemy sometimes. We let the unclean spirits run the house instead of the Holy Spirit when these spirits should be nowhere near it. We're letting sin consume us. We're letting God's will and our adherence to it become secondary and fall by the wayside. We're putting it on the back burner while we do what we want to in the meantime. And then we start judging others because we know that we're in the wrong. We want to justify it to ourselves and make that deep prodding of the Holy Spirit in our heart go away. 
1 Kings 8 and 38 says, What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house. We all know that something's plaguing our heart, and we even know what it is, but we want the conscience to stop nagging us. So we start looking for the motes to spot, and we of course find plenty of them. And the more we focus on the motes in other people's eyes, the less we focus on the beam that's protruding out of our own eye, the less we remember it, and the deeper it takes root, and the harder it is to get out in the long run. So why can't the wind of the Holy Spirit do away with the beam just like he does with the moat? Why does it have to get to that point in the first place? We know that he can do anything. Tornadoes have enough wind power to move a log. They can move it far. So we know that it's not an issue of his not being able to. The issue is that we don't let him. God never infringes on the free will that he gave to man. He never forces his will on anyone. You have a choice. When we then make that choice by welcoming in the influence of the beam into our life, we get the result of that and we have to pay the price that that entails. And we do that until we realign ourselves with God's will. We're not surrendered. We're not submitted. We're not being sacrificial when we're holding onto the beam and building a nice little home for all our pet sins and all the favorite things that we know that we shouldn't do on top of it. We're accommodating what we should be rejecting. We're inviting in what we should be keeping out. The Holy Spirit wants to move the log. He doesn't want it to be there, but you have to let him do it. Just like with the moat, the work is his to do, but he wants you to take a hand in it too. He wants to work with you. And your part is done through sacrifice. But what does this sacrifice actually look like? Like we mentioned earlier, it takes a great force of wind, like a tornado force wind to move a log. And great wind always leaves something shaken and shattered in its wake. And the same will be true in our lives too. After the log is removed, after the beam is gone, things will change. We'll be uncomfortable. We'll be forced to readjust and realign ourselves to God and his will. And that's hard. There's nothing easy about that. We have to discard all the shattered pieces of our will, all the broken pieces of our heart, and we have to offer them up as a burnt offering to God. It's then and only then that he can do what he does best and mend the brokenhearted and heal the wounded. That's what he wants to do, but that's not what we want him to do. And we're the only ones stopping the beam from being removed. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in the first verse, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children, it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's land and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the land fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Here's a classic example of the moat and the beam in action. The man stealing the poor man's land is the one with the moat, and David's the one with the beam. The thief in Nathan's parable had the much lesser offense, even though it was still an offense and it still meant something. But David had the much realer, much greater, much deeper offense. And the result was that David was blind to his own moral state. The whole Bathsheba situation was obstructing his vision. It was obstructing his discernment. Now he wasn't seeing clearly. He wasn't thinking clearly. And he wasn't judging clearly. Everything was getting muddled and confused. Bathsheba didn't just appear one day in the king's court. He welcomed her, he invited her in, and he did so readily and willingly. And now his vision was suffering because of it. Now he had a beam with planks on top of it, with a home on top of it, being built up in his heart that used to be reserved for one resident, God. But now it was being partitioned and divided for all these other invaders to come in and influence him. God is a jealous God. He doesn't share space with anyone or anything else. It's him or no one. 
Even the word for eye in the Greek in verse 3, other than meaning vision, it also means the jealous side glance. So that's implicated when we're talking about vision. God's observing us. He's watching to see if we give his place in our life to somebody else, if we're secretly and covertly inviting others' influence into our life. Vision can't help but be harmed in this scenario, and that has serious effects. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Verses 10 to 12 in 2 Samuel chapter 12 say, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Here's the perishing that comes after the lack or the obstruction or the forfeiture of vision. It's a spiritual law. It works when it's applied. And David applied it unknowingly and unwittingly here. Proverbs 29 and 18 in the classic Amplified says, Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, and enviable is he. God is a graceful, merciful, loving God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. It's not his will to see his people perish, and never is, which is why he offers us redemption, why he offers us forgiveness, and why, when we confess our sins to him, that he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. We find this with David. Verse 13 says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also have put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. He surrendered, he submitted, he sacrificed his own carnal will, his own fleshly desire. And when he came to God asking for forgiveness, God did his healing work. He sent that great mighty rushing wind, the only wind that could move that beam and allow David to clearly see again. So if we find that we're the one with the beam, or if we think we have a beam, or if we found ourselves had that tendency to always be looking for the motes in other people's eyes, what do we do? We have to get that beam out. But how do we do that? Verse 5 told us, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. The phrase cast out, it's so important, because that's what we have to do to the beam. In the Greek, it means to expel, to drive, to cast or send out. We invited the beam in. We welcomed this influence into our life with open arms. But now we need to rescind that invitation. The beam isn't going to leave easily. It's not just going to disappear one day. There's a battle that's going to take place to try to get it out. It's through the beam that the devil finds his way to sneak back into the believer's life. He gains his foothold through it, and he's intent on not losing the ground that he gained. The result is that he'll fight tooth and nail to keep and preserve that beam right where it is. That's why it requires action on our part. The beam is spiritual, and we know that what we're dealing with here is unclean spirits. The longer we go without casting them out, the more entrenched they become in our hearts, the deeper their influence becomes, and the more strong their hold becomes. We need to be bold and forceful. We need to cast them out and rebuke them. We need to forcefully expel them from our lives. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. You have to expel. You have to cast out with force, using the armor of God that he gave us for just such an occasion as this. Our weapons aren't carnal. They're not flesh and blood, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons are nice, they're great, but they mean nothing if you don't use them. You have to put on the helmet of salvation. You have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. You have to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have to use the shield of faith, and you have to use the sword of the spirit. And above all that, you have to pray. That's how we get the beam out and keep it out. When we resist the devil, he will flee, and that's a promise that we can rely on. Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 to 45 say, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. 
Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Once we have that beam out of our lives, once the planks are gone, once the house that sat upon the beam has been dismantled, we can't let it get rebuilt. We can't cast out the spirits only to have them come right back. The way that we avoid that is by resisting the devil and by not creating the right environment in our life in which they could find an entrance back. That means that we let the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, move in our life, surrendering to His healing and cleansing influence, allowing Him to drive away the chaff before those motes can become beams. It's when this happens that our vision is restored to us and we can see clearly again. It's when we don't do that that we allow the devil to take us down a dark path, with the result being that we find ourselves becoming worse and worse hypocrites. The word for hypocrite in verse 5 in the Greek means one who answers, an actor, a stage player, a dissembler, a pretender. The concordance says that it means a judging under, like a performer acting under a mask, a two-faced person whose profession does not match their practice, someone who says one thing but does another. We never want that to be us. We never want our walk of faith to just be acting, to just be playing pretend. We want the real thing. Because we're real people, we're real problems, we're in need of a real God. Anything less than what's real isn't enough, and it isn't sufficient. There's an entire world out there looking for something real too, and we do them a great disservice when we play the part of the hypocrite. It gives off the wrong impression, and it changes the way that they look at and think about Christians. David became a hypocrite at that time too, and he said one thing, but he did another, and it affected not only himself, but it affected those around him, all those who saw this taking place. Verse 14 in 2 Samuel 12 says, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. He gave great occasion for others to blaspheme. We don't want to give others occasion to speak ill of the God that we represent because of our mismatched words and actions. We want them to look at us and see the God who dwells within us, to see him for who he is, as the loving, wise, gracious, and just God that he's always been and always will be. The Holy Spirit is going to remove the most from people's eyes, and we need to show others grace as he does his work in their hearts. But we need to make up our minds that we want him to take the beam out of our eyes too. Let's close in prayer. Lord, today we thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us, to make his home and his abode within our spirit. Lord, today we invite in all his influence. We welcome his influence into our life. And we thank you that his influence is spreading all throughout every corner of our lives. Lord, today we cast out, today we forcefully expel any and every unclean spirit looking to exert influence over our hearts and our minds and over every area of our life. Lord, today we proclaim freedom and deliverance. We proclaim healing and cleansing of our spirit. Lord, we thank you that you're sending the wind of the Holy Ghost to move in every corner of our life, to drive out these foul, unclean spirits. And Lord, we thank you that when those spirits try to come back, that they'll find that that house isn't empty, but that it's being dwelled by your Holy Spirit, that there's no vacancy in the inn. Lord, we thank you that you fill us up, that we're spirit-filled, and Lord, as the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, does His work in and through us, Lord, we thank You that those results will go on to magnify and glorify Your name. Lord, we give You all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, if you want to cast out the motes and beams out of your eyes, have your spiritual eyes open and receive your sight, and have Jesus as a part of your life today, all you need to do is to invite Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. You then need to repent of your sins and ask for his forgiveness. Then you trust that you've been forgiven and you ask for his free gift of eternal life. Now, if you prayed this from a sincere heart and you truly meant it, then you are now a part of the family of God. Welcome to God's family. We want to thank everybody for listening today. We appreciate you taking out your time to spend with us. If you want even more of the King's Word, you can go to our YouTube page at King's Word Ministry, visit our TikTok page at King's Word Bible, and our Instagram page at King's Word Bible Study. God bless you. 
We want you to know that we love you all, and we'll see you next week as we continue to study the King's Word together.